it, it's more surreal than any Asimov story you could imagine. I remember I was traveling around China once uh, trying to learn about agriculture and uh, one of the companies I visited was called China Green Agriculture. It's a company based in Xi'an and I went in and I was all like positive about China and agriculture and the you know this company that was making fertilizer and I go into the company and I and they have a sign for some totally other company and I say where's China Green Agriculture and they say what? And I say, this is the address for this listed company called China Green, Green Agriculture. And the, the, the receptionist says, oh, yeah, I think there might be a listed company. It's something else. And, you know, I, I sit down with the general manager once I sort out where I am. And he tells me totally different things than the company is disclosed. And I realize, oh, my God, this is a total fraud. And it's listed on, on the U.S. exchange and trade. It was trading then at like $300, $400 million. And uh, nobody seems to know that. So that kind of, that kind of got, got me started. I felt like I had to disclose that. I ended up writing a report on that company and there, another company called uh, China Agritech, which is very similar and also really completely fraudulent. And uh, that kind of got me going. I think it's just a sort of innate sense of outrage. What you need to do is think, how transparent is this? How much can I really see? You know, Alibaba has, has what, upwards of, of a thousand consolidated uh, subsidiaries right now. Um, there are, you know, simple companies, you know, Baidu probably has about a hundred. Uh, there are much simpler companies that operate through, you know, 30 or 40 uh, operating entities. The question is, if you were running that company, would you really be able to get a handle on the operations? And if the answer is no, or you're not sure, then you better not invest in that company. I would say that the most common type of fraud we find in China is um, what you would call propping and tunneling fraud, where you, 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 you report fake margins and more profit than you really have and then you have to tunnel it off your balance sheet by having fake assets so that that's the most common thing so you'll see a company that says it's making i don't know let's say you know pleather seats for for cars and they're claiming that they make uh you know 60 percent margins and they're really making 20 percent margins so that's let's say you know 100 million dollars a year in fake profits so they have these weird bonds that they that they own. So that's common in China. In the U.S., that's not such a common sort of strategy. You find that that they tend to distribute the the padding through a whole lot of different categories of their financial statements. So it takes more forensic work on the financials in in the U.S. companies. Essentially, you look for anomalies. You look for. Uh, gross margins that are too big, you look for uh, big assets on the balance sheet, you look for companies that claim a lot of cash but are nevertheless uh, borrowing, and once you find those flags, then you start to look at the, uh, at, at, the, at the business itself. Evergrande is kind of the Lehman Brothers of China. Um, Evergrande eventually will go, and when it does, it will spell really bad news for the Chinese economy generally. So I just saw, oh my God, Evergrande is misrepresenting everything it does. You know, it's, it's, it's selling these apartments as if they were bonds. Uh, people are, you know, using these apartments as leverage. They're taking out all sorts of uh, shadow bank loans. Um, they're, they're paying their suppliers in apartments. You know, all of these weird, weird practices um, and, you know, surely that can't be a good bet for the investor. Uh, there were, I, I think I started following it in about 2012. I must have visited at least 40 different Evergrande projects. I think I've seen maybe two or three that were fully occupied. Um, and yet, you know, they're all fully sold. Um, 
and uh, you know, you go. It, it, it's more surreal than any Asimov story you could imagine. You just go into these these massive complexes, some of which are built for fifty and sixty thousand people, and there will be you know a supposed theater that's all boarded up with bats flying around and, you know, all dark. And there'll be a supermarket with chain locks on the doors because it never opened. Um, there'll be, you know, row after row of villa with maybe one in eight that's actually occupied. It's, um, you know, ghost town after ghost town they build and yet they're selling the dream of someday in the future, this is going to turn into Paris and people believe it.